number two. We start lecture number two. Uh, last time we discussed integration management. So we talked about in general what is management and what is the role of a project manager. So I created a, um, one slide to, uh, to recap what we, what we agreed about last time. Um, I mentioned to you that there is a so-called management triangle. The, the three elements, three components, which you as a project manager must keep in sync. So you must be always guarantee, you must always guarantee to everybody who uh, participate in the project, including the customer who pays the money, including the programmers who are uh, who work with you, including uh, users who are going to use your project, your product. So everybody who is involved, they are interested to have you on board as a project manager in order to make sure that you synchronize these three elements together. So you keep them in sync. So you always know what is the scope of the project. You always know what is the cost and what is the time. So you always, always should be able to answer very in a very affirmative way in a very um, you know in a very uh, you have to be very very sure when you answer the question what is the total cost of the project will be so how much time or how much money we're going to spend when the project will stop and it doesn't mean that you have to uh, that you that we should blame you if you give us the information which we don't like so if you tell us today that the project will finish in 20 years instead of two months then it's not your fault, it's the reality. Your fault is if you say that you don't know when the project will finish. Then you don't play the role of a project manager correctly. So your role is to keep these three elements in sync. And when one element, one of them, moves into either direction, maybe increases or maybe decreases, your job is to, uh, to move other two elements as well. So you do not allow one of them to move. For example, the customer shows up and says, we want to finish it sooner instead of uh, how it was planned and you just say okay we'll do it and you don't move the other two elements you don't move the budget you don't increase the budget in this case and you don't decrease the scope that's going to be your fault as a project manager so you are a, a person who makes sure that they are in sync today we're going to talk about scope one of these three elements this lecture will be about scope the next one will be about uh, cost and then or maybe the other way around uh, the next one will be about time and then the next one about cost and then we'll move to other elements of project management so scope it seems to be probably the most important how to control scope how to make sure that you understand what is in scope and you can guarantee that nothing falls out of scope so nothing is there which the customer expects and then when the project is finished, then the customer is surprised because everybody forgot about that. Who a fault, who's going to be a fault, at fault in this case, you can probably already imagine. So as the previous lecture, as in all other lectures in this course, we have eight questions. I'm going to ask you eight questions. You write down the answers and then we discuss one by one and I'll give you the right answers. So question number one. Um, imagine the customer didn't ask for the feature, but the programmer shows up, you're the project manager, the programmer shows up and says that this additional feature is great, it's interesting, it may be beneficial for the product, the, the users will love it, so how about we implement it? So what do you say as a project manager? The first answer, you definitely reject this request, you say no, we're not going to do that, so the programmer will be quite disappointed, and users too. Question answer number two, uh, you say maybe we should discuss it with the customer first. So you, you don't say no, but you need to discuss with the customer. Answer number three, you say only if it doesn't delay all other features. So you're kind of trying to, uh, to, to, to balance the, um, the situation. And uh, number four, you say yes, because customers first and users first. Actually, in this case, probably I should say instead of, instead of customer, we can say user first. And let the user be the priority number one, as many uh, companies and teams believe. So, pick the answer and write it down on the paper. Second question, uh, what, it, what, what definition, which definition of a task for a programmer looks more accurate, more, in this case it says perfect, so instead of perfect we can say, instead of perfect we can say more, maybe more accurate, uh, more reasonable, more effective, the, the better, which way you would formulate the, the task being a project manager, so you formulate the tasks for for programmers, you tell them what to do and uh, which definition is better. So you read the definitions, I'm not going to re repeat them uh, out loud. So pick one which you think is more suitable. They, they are different, as you can see, they, they define the task differently, so programmers will react differently. 
So on how you define your task depends how the programmers or other people, testers, quality assurance people, designers, graphic designers, uh, DevOps engineers, all the different people who will be in your team, they will react to your definitions of the tasks and they will either perform well, either will be, uh, will be delivering uh, enough results to you and to everybody, or they will fall behind and then you will be unhappy and in trouble. So from how you define the task depends a lot of things, how you define the scope for your programmers. The customer defines scope for the whole team, for the whole project, and your job as a project manager is to decompose this, this job into smaller jobs, into micro tasks, into smaller work packages. So pick the right answer. Question number three, which one is the right formulation of a functionality in a use case? So maybe some of you don't know what is a use case, and I don't expect you to know right now. We will discuss it in a few minutes, but still look at the answers here and what is your what what's your gut feeling here so what do you feel is the right answer how would you define describing the functionality how would you define what the user can do so imagine use case is kind of a paper which the customer gives you and says i want my application to work this way so in this paper how would you formulate the feature of a user pick the right answer you see the difference actually in the in the verb in the formulation it's just a, it could be it may look like a tiny difference here, but uh, trust me, it is big. Question number four. Uh, a customer asks you to show how much work is left to be done. It's a very typical question for project managers. So how much is left? How much we still need to do? So where do you find this information? Where do you go? Who do you ask? Who's going to be your, uh, your point of contact? How do you, how do you collect? First one, First option, you ask your team, because your team is actually working with the task. So you go to them and ask them uh, what they know, and, and they will tell you. Uh, answer two, in use cases, we're going to discuss what use cases are. Answer three, backlog. Uh, and answer four, traceability metrics. You may not know what is use cases, what are the use cases, what is the backlog, and what is traceability metrics, but try to give an answer anyway. Let's, let's assume that some of you actually maybe some of you know something about project management and software development and software engineering so give your honest the best answer question number five which one is not a non-functional requirement we're going to discuss again in a few minutes what is the difference between between the functional requirements and non-functional requirements but for now just look at these four uh, texts and say which one uh, doesn't look like a, a, a proper definition of, of a non-functional requirement. Again, maybe you don't know what is NFR, NFR is, but imagine it's, it should be logical, it should be just intuitively clear that we have functional requirements when we say that the, the, the application, the software, must be able to do this and this. So I should be able to click the button and download the picture. I should be able to uh, scroll the screen up and the picture moves down. Or I scroll the screen down, the, the picture moves up. So this is the functional, these are the functional requirements. And there's also non-functional requirements. For example, I say that when I scroll the screen, then it should move fast. And I scroll the screen down, it should be, it should moving, it should move smoothly. So I should not feel that I, that there are, there are steps and uh, there are glitches in the, the movement uh, mechanism of the of the screen so these are the category of non-functional requirements so that's a clear should be in the perfect world there should be should be a clear line between them the functional and non-functional so which one do you think is not a non-functional requirement so pick one and we move forward um, Question six, after six months of hard work, your team releases the product to customer servers and then the customer says, this is not what I wanted. And it's a very typical situation as well. Many software teams, they face this reality once in a while. So they do something actively, they work on something, they believe that they develop uh, what the customer actually wanted. And then when the time comes and the customer looks at the product, the customer gets unhappy, so they say just, uh, this, is not, this is not the functionality I wanted. So you developed me the application for download, downloading pictures, but I was expecting to upload the pictures. So it seems like you misunderstood me, so I'm not going to pay you, in a worst case. Yeah, and then it's a big failure for, for everybody. So who is at fault? So who made a mistake? Who are we going to blame? So option number one, we blame the project manager. You, the project manager. 
Option number two, the customer, because the customer didn't explain properly. So we, how can we implement what we, what we, what you wanted be, while you didn't tell us? So it's your fault. The testers. So the testers, they, they were expect, we were expecting them to test the product, to run it on different scenarios, to run on different test servers and make sure it worked, they, that the product worked. So now we need to fire them. Or number four, it's nobody's fault. So that's, a, that's a, a, another philosophy of management where we believe that we shouldn't blame anybody. We shouldn't look for who's, a, who's at fault, who made a mistake. It's a, it's a wrong strategy because it's going to demotivate people. It's going to uh, destructively affect the, the morale of the team. They're going to be unhappy. Many people will be unhappy. And nobody's going to win in the end because the customer is still, uh, still not get the product. So still, still doesn't have the the result that the customer expected. But at the same time, we have unhappy people in the team. So who wins? Nobody. So we don't blame. We just learn and improve. So basically, the, the asking the question, whose fault is this, is a mistake, according to the answer number four. So we shouldn't ask this question. So now pick the, the answer. Question number seven, a project of one year and five programmers. Imagine the project, which should be which should go for one year long and five people will be involved. It's a pretty large project. Can we decompose it into how many work packages? Work packages is something which in PMBOK, we discussed this, uh, this fundamental book in project management. So they define this, uh, this uh, they, they give this definition of a work package. So this is like a, uh, a, a non-breakable unit of work, which we can assign to the implementer. So in our case, there are programmers. And maybe if you work in some uh, you know, task tracking system, for example, uh, Jira or Trello or GitHub, then this is probably the, the ticket which you assign to a programmer. And the ticket says what needs to be done. So there's a definition of the, of the problem to be solved. So you're the project manager and I come to you in the beginning of the project and I ask you this question. So to how many work packages you're going to decompose this large project? So how are you going to calculate that scope? So that's a scope decomposition problem. You look at the large scope and then you need to break it down into pieces. So how do you do this? How many elements are you going to have? The first answer, you cannot calculate. Nobody knows this number. Unpredictable. Uh, question answer number two, seven. Maybe it may make sense. Think about this. Uh, answer number three, it's a calculation, a formula. So I give you the formula. So we imagine we have 25 sprints. We have five coders, one work package per week. So like approximate estimate. And then I, I came up with a number, 250 work packages. So 250 tickets that will be in the ticket tracking system. And then answer number four, hundreds. So many, 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 many. We don't know how many. Uh, hundreds, not we don't know, we, we say hundreds, maybe 300, 500, something like this. So how would you answer in this case? And the last question, uh, which estimate of project scope is the most reasonable? That's a tricky question. Uh, think about the answer. Uh, which estimate is most reasonable? 100 function points, some amount of pull requests, some amount of lines of code, and some amount of hours of work, including weekends. So how are we going to, again, let's say it's a question from the customer. So the customer is asking you, okay, what is the scope of this project? And you can answer, we know we're going to write down 50,000 lines of code. That's the amount of work we're going to do. Or your answer will be, we're going to create 500 pull requests or some amount of function points. Or maybe we just say, we're going to work 10,000 work hours. So just pay us. Actually, this, this, this estimate which you deliver, on this number, the money will be based. So remember the triangle. So this is if this is your scope definition, then there will be cost and there will be time. So they, these three elements, they must be in sync. So when you deliver me, if I'm your customer, if you tell me the scope, then from here, you will somehow calculate the cost. So you will say, you know what, for the, for the scope, we say it's 10,000 hours, for example. One hour will cost me, I don't know, for, for example, $50. So you multiply, and this is the budget for the project, 5,000, like half a million dollars, because of the definition of the scope. So how you define the scope from these numbers, you will derive the information about the cost. So these, these things are connected. So that's why it's a very important question, exactly how you will define the scope, using which which uh, uh, which units of measurement so give you answer and we roll back to the first question 
I hope you managed to record all your answers. In the end, remember, we're going to ask the question to all of you how many right answers you got. And we will check how many of you already have some feeling, some, some understanding of what is the, the right project management. Again, let me give a disclaimer like the previous lecture that this is very opinionated course. So I'm giving my opinion of what I believe is the right project manager. So maybe some of my opinions will be, will, will be different from what you get from the literature, from, from what you get from other teachers, from uh, software practitioners, from other people. So take it with a grain of salt, you know, look at my opinion, look at their opinion and then formulate your own opinion. So build your own vision of how you see project management. So in this answer, in this question, maybe some of you already maybe understand it's not so difficult question that this is the right answer. The right answer is number one. So you definitely not. So you and this actually the questions, they are they, they stay in the line from the worst to the best. So this is the worst. This is completely wrong. This one. This one is a bit better. This one is a bit better. This one is perfect. So why this one is completely wrong? Because, because it leads to, uh, to immediate uh, degradation, immediate, uh, you know, uh, how to say, uh, dis destruction. We, we, completely, we immediately destroy the triangle, the management triangle. If you immediately accept the functionality, yeah, immediate scope creep, exactly. Yeah, the, Thank you for, uh, for, for, for the comment. It's called scope creep, exactly. So it, it goes to immediately, uh, the, the scope just gets bigger while other elements of the triangle, they stay the same because you already, you accepted it. You said customer first. So you, you, your good intentions to satisfy the, the needs of the customer uh, get into the scope immediately. And it leads not only to scope creep, but also to the thing which is called uh, if you look at this tag, it's called gold plating. Gold plating is uh, is when you it's it's this term uh, came to the project management from the uh, from uh, from manufacturing. So let's say you are making uh, chairs. So you make chairs, and I come to you as a customer, and I say, please give me the chair. I want to buy a chair from you, so build it for me. I want the chair of this size, this this weight. It should be built from wood. So I'm going to use it in my kitchen to, to drink tea and sit on it and drink tea every morning. And then I come to you in a few days and you give me the chair, which is covered in gold. So you cover the chair with the, with the gold and you tell me, you know, now it's going to cost half a million dollars. Not a hundred dollars, but it's going to cost you way more. Why? Because I made it in gold. I, I covered it in gold. So I did the gold plating. You didn't ask for it. I know, but I feel that you're going to be happy because of this. I feel that I, I'm, I, I have, I very well understand your needs and I want to make you happy. In order to make you happy, I give you what you didn't even ask. In most cases, it leads to conflicts between customers and, and the project. So you deliver more than they asked. You shouldn't do that. You should deliver what was agreed. So we agreed that the project will do this and this. The functionality will be this and that. We do it. If we feel that we want to do something extra, then we at least need to ask the customer who is paying the money. We need to discuss with the customer. Well, at least first we need to check even before. We, maybe we decide not to talk to the customer. It's wrong. But we can at least check the other two elements of the, of the triangle. We can say, okay, if it doesn't delay all other features, so we care about the features which the customer wants, first of all, then we care about our feeling of what is good for the user. We shouldn't play the role of a user. The user has its own representative in the project. It's maybe a customer or maybe somebody else. So we should listen to them. And programmers, they're not a good source of this information. The programmer may, may give an advice. The programmer may say, I believe that this is going to be uh, a, good, uh, a good feature. So we put it into the backlog or somewhere. We, we write it down. We make a paper. And then we go to the customer and we ask the customer. So we discuss with the customer first. So we call the customer and say, you know, one of our programmers, a bright guy, believes that uh, a user should be able not only to download the pictures, but also to listen to music in your mobile application. How about this? You know, it will be funny. Not only download the, the important documents, but also click the button and there will be music playing. And the customer will say, yeah, it's a great idea, but maybe not now, not in this application. It's going to be the decision of a customer. 
So the right answer is definitely not. So you say not, but, here we can say but, we write it down, the idea. So we shouldn't throw it away, of course. We don't want to make the programmer unhappy because the programmer was, uh, uh, was putting the creativity into, into the work they do. So we shouldn't uh, shut it down, but we definitely should not allow them to start working on that. Because the question is, a programmer, a programmer suggests to implement, not suggest to put it into backlog, not suggest to discuss with the customer. The programmer already suggests, let me implement it. How about I do it? Now or on the weekend, sometimes some excited programmers, they may suggest the weekend work. So I'm going to do it on the weekend, on my own free time. You still need to say no. Your job is to control the scope. Your job is to, to, to make sure, as a project manager, that what is written in the document, what is specified, what we agreed, only these things are being done. So gold plating is evil. It's, it's a sin which most projects suffer from when they do something which was not planned. In the end, we have a huge, um, a huge, uh, how do you say, uh, a huge uh, uh, damage done to the expectations of programmers. Because programmers all, like, through the project life cycle, the programmers will believe that they are doing the right thing. They intend to help. They will help. But in the end, we end up with an unhappy customer. And the whole project is ruined. And all programmers, they're going to blame you. You as a project manager will be, this is going to be your fault. Because your job was to stop them when it was necessary to stop. To stop their creativity. To take control of their creativity. And you didn't. You were just good guy letting them do what they feel is right. In the end, everybody failed. So that's the first trouble you may experience. Second question. Which definition of a task of a programmer sounds the best, sounds perfect for you? Again, they are sorted from the worst to the best. So this is absolutely wrong definition of a task for a programmer. Make the customer happy. Make sure the customer is happy. Programmers are not the people who make customers happy. Programmers, they write code. Programmers implement features. Programmers fix bugs. They have no idea how to make the customer happy and they don't want to make to, to understand this. They don't want to feel this connection with the customer. Some, again, some practitioners, some books will tell you that this is important, that every programmer feels the connection with the customer, that every programmer works for the customer. Every programmer, single programmer, even a large company, they feel that they satisfy the needs of a customer. I don't believe that. I, I disagree with this, with this approach. I believe that the, the, the more specific, the more detailed, the more uh, narrow is the definition of the task. And the less noise, marketing noise, I don't want to say this word, but the, the less garbage you put into the definition of the, of the task, the clearer it will be for the programmer what to do, and the more satisfied, the more happy will be that person, and the, the, the easier, the faster, uh, that pro the programmer will deliver the results. So your job is to filter out all the noise, all the marketing, uh, blah, 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 from the definition of the task and definitely never say that the programmers, that their job is to make the customers happy. That only makes them scary because they don't know what it means to make a, how to make a customer happy. It's a customer is a big person. It's a big, um, a big uh, figure in in their eyes. So to make them happy, and, and how can I do it? If I if I write Java code, how can I make a customer happy? There are many other factors which affect the happiness of the happiness of the customer. Don't do this. So this 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 uh, the uh, the answer number four. It's a it will only mislead you. Uh, yeah, there's a question uh, saying that. Uh, uh, the, 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 uh, some of you asking, I thought the project manager should formulate tasks in terms of business. Definitely not. The project manager should listen to the business requirements, understand the business requirements, and then reformulate them to the technical language. So programmers should not worry about the business. Programmers don't understand the business and they shouldn't understand the business. Technical people, and they understand technical Questions. They understand how to implement Java classes. They understand how to fix Java bugs. They don't know what's good, what's bad for the business. There should be somebody else in the project who will resolve these questions. Maybe the product manager, product owner, or maybe the representative of a customer, or maybe the requirements person. Somebody who understands uh, the business language. Maybe sometimes they're called system analyst or business analyst. 
The person who listens to the customer, understands the language they say, and translate this to the language of programmers. And your job as a project manager is to coordinate the work of these people. So you put the, the system analyst to talk to the customer, then the system analyst generates the tasks, and then you dispatch these tasks to programmers, making sure that the tasks are defined clearly on the technical level. And you should teach, as a, as a project manager, you should teach programmers and tell programmers always that, hey guys, if you, if you get the task even by mistake, and in this task you, you see something which you don't understand or you don't want to understand, maybe some language from the business, just reject the task. It's our fault. We will reformulate it for you. We will write it down on a technical level. The next question, so is the project manager aware of all the tests that are in the code base? Is project manager then responsible for writing the tests? The project manager should not even be technically competent. So as a project manager, you, if you are a good project manager, you will not need uh, programming skills. You will not need, uh, you will not even need to understand what they are doing there, or what kind of tasks they are solving. You will have people for that. So you will, for example, you give the task to the programmer and you ask the programmer, do you understand how to implement this without talking to anybody else, without involving some customers, without involving any business languages. Do you understand clearly what is the technical task? And if they say, no, I don't understand, then your job as a project manager is to connect this task to somebody who will clarify, who will uh, improve the definition of the task. So it's all about, you see the tag, it's all about the definition. We go, we go down to this definition of done, so-called. It's a quite um, famous term in, in project management, definition of done. So when you define your task the way that the, the person who is assigned to the task knows exactly what is the definition of done, so what should I do in order to stop this task, in order to close, in order to make sure that I've done everything that it was required. For me, the task should be formulated in the beginning the right way. And definitely this is not the right way. Making somebody happy. I'm not a psychologist. I don't know how to make somebody happy. I'm not, I'm not a clown here to dance in front of a customer. I only know how to write Java code. So please formulate the task for me the way that I can be able to put all my skills which I have and to, and to deliver the results uh, the project expects. So you as a project manager, uh, your job is to, uh, to make this bridge to connect the technical people, implementers, with the requirements coming from the customer. Sometimes you cannot do it yourself. Again, if you don't have the skills, for example, you become a project manager in a project which, which is, uh, I don't know, making a, a, a medical research, and you are a graduated, graduated student from computer science. But still, if you have the skills for project management, you can manage a project which, which are doing the research of a new drugs, of a new, of a new, uh, of a new pills or whatever. Because you know the principle of project management. You know that from one side you need to understand the scope. So you need to understand from the customer what the customer needs. And then you need somehow, with the help of other people maybe, to decompose this scope into smaller elements. And each of these elements must be clearly understood by implementers. But you should not connect them. Because lazy project managers and the books for lazy project managers, they recommend just connect them. Just let the customers talk to programmers. It will be great because you don't need to do anything in this case as a project manager. You can only, uh, I don't know, sit in the office and pretend to be, uh, pretend to be a good leader. But that's, that's just a lack of project management. You should, you should not just... This, this connection will only make the problems bigger because they, they speak different languages. And in the end, programmers will lose their definition of done. They will just don't know what they need to do. They will not know. The best of them will be super unhappy and frustrated. Some of them will quit because they will see that they, they have no mechanisms to complete their tasks. The tasks are so vague. The, the tasks have so many external factors, external dependencies. It's, it's, so un, it's so difficult to talk to customers. Only few of these programmers will be able to survive in, this, in, this, um, in such an environment. The other people will be either, they will either quit or they will be just doing nothing. So they will understand that there is no project management. So there is total chaos in the area of requirements. So everybody speak different languages. Nobody understands each other or hardly understand what needs to be done. So it's a huge opportunity for lazy people to do nothing. And they will. And, and this is what will happen. And, and who to blame? You as a project manager. So it's your fault that you didn't organize 
this transformation, this translation of the requirements which are coming to, from the customer to some sort of a document, could be any document, but it should be some somewhere written document, and then from here to, to tasks. Uh, another question. So somebody technical said to project manager that test 15 is crucial to be passed and PM then translates these tasks to programmers. Uh, no, in this case, if you if you move up to the definition, so we, let me let me get there. So this we already agreed is not the right answer. The answer number three, together with the team, remove the problem as, as, as soon as possible. That's again, this is the uh, manipulative, uh, manipulative word, which is a together with the team. So do it together. In general, try to avoid group responsibility. Let me say a few words about this too. So group responsibility is quite also a toxic uh, instrument of manipulating people. When you say this task is for everybody or this task is for these three people, so do it together. Nothing ruins responsibility and ruins uh, quality better than group responsibility. When everybody is responsible, nobody is responsible. So if you do it, you, you do it often, if you, if you play this card, you make your life easier because you, 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 you are able to uh, keep the tasks uh, on a large uh, scale. So again, you can deal with bigger tasks. So you can say, this is a task for three weeks and this is a group of five programmers, so do it together. You're basically saying, in other words, that I'm incompetent as a project manager to decompose this task into five smaller tasks or maybe 50 smaller tasks. So I just tell every, tell you, the group, just do it yourself because I don't know how to do it. Or I'm lazy. Or I don't have time. I have no motivation for this. So that's, uh, that's definitely not the right answer. So every task should be individually assigned to the, to the programmer, to the implementer. So you find a person, you create a task, you Ideally, you have a number of these tasks, it should be a ticket or whatever, and then you call the programmer and say, this is your personal task. You complete it, you're good. You don't complete it, you have problems. You don't complete many tasks, you get fired. Some sort of mechanism should exist like this. It should be personal responsibility. Never say group responsibility, like, hey, we all together failed this task. That's a completely wrong strategy, because in this case, you, you encourage them to be lazy. You encourage them to, uh, to work less. You encourage them to, to look at each other, to look over the shoulder and see who, who to blame. Nobody. So we, they're going to blame all of us together. OK, so now my job is to just try to find a reason why I was not the problem. I was not the, the troublemaker. That's what these people will be looking for. Not for the good results, but for, for reasons, for excuses why it was not my fault when the, the task is not complete. So never say this together. Don't put people together. Uh, this option number two, fix the build, make sure it's green. Well, it's better. So you are saying exactly what needs to happen. So fix the build. It means that it implies that the build is broken right now. So you're just saying, hey, Jeffrey, fix the build. So when, what is the definition of done? The build is broken. Then we go into fixed build. So we, they, we expect the programmer to move it from the red state to the green state. It was red, now it's becoming green. One person is responsible, so the, the person can do it. What is not mentioned here is what can I do to, to do this? Like, what are my instruments? What are my, uh, what are my permissions? And very often programmers will blame you as a project manager for bad management because they will say, you didn't give me enough instruments. Yes, I can fix the build, but I don't have access to repository. I don't have access to the server. And the server is managed by the DevOps and the DevOps on vacation today. So how can I fix the build? You come to the programmer tomorrow and try to blame the programmer for not completing the task. But the programmer will try to shift the responsibility to another person. So there, in this task, there are, there are too many dependencies, hidden dependencies. And if I would be a programmer, I would not like this task to see in my, uh, in, in my backlog because it's if the project is large. On a very small project, when I have access to all the necessary components of the, of the, of the repository, of repositories, then I can do that. On larger projects, it's difficult. So this, this, uh, this definition of the task involves hidden dependencies. But again, look at the important line I mentioned here. When the task is not complete, we blame the program. We blame the person who was on the task. It's important. If you are a project manager, you, if you're a good project manager, you can't blame programmer. If you're a weak project manager, if your management is, is lousy, if your management has many mistakes, then you will technically not be able to blame. If you give me the task like this, together with the team, remove the problem SAP, and in two days the problem is not removed, can you really blame me? It will be very hard for you because I will say, you said together with the team, 
I was trying to get the team together, but he was not helping me, and he was not helping, and he was on vacation. So don't blame me. And you can't. If you are a reasonable person, then you, you cannot really prove that it was my fault. But you remember in the last lecture, we discussed that the project manager should be like a judge. The project manager should be even like a punishment person in the team. So you will not be able to punish me. That means there will be no project management. So if you cannot punish, it means you're a weak project manager. If you can, it means you clearly defined all tasks. It means you clearly, it means you clearly and, and, and very um, non-ambiguously and very, uh, and very um, explicitly defined what needs to be done. In this case, it's easy to blame because I wrote you exactly what needs to be done. To be done. For example, answer number one. I told you, make sure this particular test passes in the master branch and then come back to me. So I can easily come back to you in two days and say, okay, I still see the test failing. It's your fault as a programmer, not anybody else. You cannot, it will be very hard for you to tell me that it wasn't your fault. I will tell exactly that it's your fault, so fix something. It doesn't mean that I'm going to fire you immediately. It doesn't mean that I'm going to do some negative things to you. But I will tell you that, that, that you failed in this task. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. It doesn't mean I don't like you. It just means that in this particular task, you fail. Maybe in the next task, you will succeed. And if we have many tasks, then sometimes you will fail. Sometimes you will succeed. But overall, if we look at the entire progress over the year, then we will see, okay, you failed in 15% of the tasks. 85% you succeeded. That's okay. That's more or less. It, it's acceptable. So you get the bonus. You're, you're a good programmer. Everything is good. So it, it, we, we, because the tasks are, they, they should be reasonably small, right? Um, so the more, the, 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 the more clarity you put in the definition of task, the better. Um, the above description tries to answer the question, how does project manager obtain the knowledge that uh, test 15 exists? Okay, so how does the manager know that this task needs to be create, needs to be assigned to the programmer and how the project manager can write this text, right? So how the project manager can formulate this text if, if the project manager is not a programmer. The project manager doesn't need to formulate this test, this text. The project manager doesn't need to decide who is the right programmer for the task. The project manager can ask another programmer to do it for, for him. So if I'm a project manager, I will call one programmer and say, what are the problems right now in our repository? What needs to be fixed and improved in order to deliver the result to the customer on the weekend. What do you think? And the programmer will sit down, the, he's a knowledgeable programmer, so he will write down me a list of items like this, 15 of them, 15 lines, 15, 15 descriptions of the task. And I will look at these descriptions, I will go to my five and other programmers and say, three for you, three for you, three for you, and three for you. They will, some of them will come to me and say, I don't like this task, it's not clear. I don't like that one, I don't understand what's about. And I don't like this one because it's too hard to implement, I don't have the skills. What do I do? I pick this task, I go back to my original programmer and say, look, there are problems with the three tasks you defined. Can you please improve, clarify them? And the programmer, the original one, makes the refinements and returns back to me the task. I give this task again to, another, to other programmers. You see, I have no idea what they're talking about. I don't know what these tasks are about. What are you talking? Python, Java, C Sharp? I don't care. I just connect them in the right way. I know that one person must be the, the definer of the problem. Another must be the fixer of the problem. My job is to connect them. Instead of just saying, hey, my team, please do everything because I trust you because you're a good programmer. And then they dive into the total mess and I, I, I don't know who to ask what. In, in a number of months, and then maybe if I'm lucky, maybe if the team is extremely conscious and extremely responsible, then maybe they will deliver something. Uh, so, but in reality, in most cases, it don't happen. It doesn't happen. Yeah, so your description is quite correct. Yeah, so the job of a manager is not to know deeply what the task is about, but to dispatch, sort of a dispatch. Or maybe the project manager can organize a dispatch. The project manager may not need to do it manually, doesn't need to do it by, him, by himself. He may, if I'm a project manager, I may assign somebody for this task and say, your job every morning to go around the office, check who is doing what, what are the tasks, and then do some, I don't know, cross-checking of their definitions or whatever. You just need to understand that the problem needs to be solved, the problem of unclear definitions of the scope. So if the scope is not clear, clearly defined for the programmer, 
many problems will, will start from there. So you as a project manager is an architect of the project, not the architect of a product, but the architect of a project. The project manager is somebody who may be called an architect of the, of the process, the architect of people. So the project manager decides who sits where and who does what in a way, in what way. It doesn't, the project manager doesn't decide we're going to use this database or we're going to use Java or C++. But the project manager architects people and say you depend on, on him and he depends on her and she depends on him. Depends how? By the tasks, the flow of tasks should go in this direction. I see you have one more question. Uh, why in this case project manager does this connection job at all? Can't she, he said, uh, say to a team leader to pass all tasks and team leader then assigns this task on his own? Uh, I don't know who is team leader. In my opinion, team leader and project manager is the same. Maybe you're calling team leader the, the chief architect, the chief, the technical guy. So you're saying senior developer. Okay, yeah, that's, that's who you mean. So uh, why the project manager needs to be involved? Well, uh, uh, if the team leader, uh, who you say team leader, wants to do the, the, the task management, then yes, it's okay. If the team leader, if, if the architect is interested in, in decomposing the, the work and then assigning the tasks and de dealing with the tasks which are improperly assigned, then it's okay. But usually it's quite routine, bureaucratic work. And senior people, me for example, I would not be happy doing it every day. If you imagine it's a big project, I have 25 programmers, so I'm going to have two, three hours every day busy doing this uh, conflict resolution, looking at their task descriptions, understanding what's not clear there, who didn't understand what, and then going, going to other people, trying, asking them to help. So it's, in my opinion, it's quite bureaucratic work, this de decomposition of the, of the scope. Maybe you can give it to a computer. Maybe you can give it to the AI. Maybe you can give it to some automated instruments, which will do it for you. They will, they will somehow automate this process. But doing it manually for a senior technical guy, I think it's, uh, it's overkill. Uh, yeah, you, you're right again that you're saying we have a, a discussion here in the chat. So uh, uh, you're saying that the project manager dives deeper into the details of implementation of the project by contacting technical guys about specific problems. Yes, your technical people are your hands and your eyes. You shouldn't you shouldn't trust yourself in this if you're the project manager. You should not trust yourself on the technical questions. You should know that the people who work with you, they know better. So every time you have a technical, uh, technical question, or you have some, uh, some doubts about which task is bigger, which task is smaller, which task is properly defined, which task needs to be done now or maybe later, you always ask technical people. You, you come to them and ask and they provide you their opinion. You, the, that's a, again, one of the biggest problems of mistakes of project managers who believe that they are technically competent and they start making technical decisions. They just look at the task description and say, oh, I know this task can be done better by Jeffrey and this one by Mary, because I know Mary is very good in this, in this area. How do you know? You're a project manager, you're a coordinator, you're, you're, you're an expert in different things, in managing things, but not in making the decision what Mary can do better, which part of the technical Task. Ask Mary or maybe ask Jeffrey. Hey, Jeffrey, what do you think if I give this task to Mary? And Jeffrey will tell you yes or no. And then you rely on this opinion and then you make it a decision. So that's how a project manager, good project manager, decomposes the scope into pieces. You must decompose. You, you, you deal with a huge definition of the scope, which is coming in uh, requirement specification usually. So you look at this uh, requirement specification and you decide how to break it down into pieces with the help of your people. Uh, I said that it should not be a job of project manager. Project manager, yeah, that's right. Okay, we close on this. I think we're on the same page. So, the bottom line, you must decompose your work into smaller pieces and each piece must be like a contract with a programmer. Imagine the programmer is a contractor. So imagine you pay for this task, for each task you pay for the, to the programmer. So the programmer is able to go to the court and say, I completed the task and you will be able and you will have to provide the evidence that no, you didn't complete the task. Always giving the task to your people, think in this, in this way. Think like a micro contract, a contract, another contract, another contract. That's how you deal with, you know, with scope decomposition. The customer gave you a large contract. Your job is to make micro contracts to your people. 
Okay, question number three. I think we're a little bit behind schedule. Um, which one is the right formulation of a functionality if in the use, on the use case? Um, here, the right answer is this one. And then again, they go, uh, I think, in the order of wrongness down here. So this is okay, more or less. This is even worse. This is completely wrong. What is the use case? The use case is in my opinion, the best way to describe what your system should do. So when the customer comes to you, you need to define the scope. How are you going to do it? Uh, like, remember, the scope is an element of triangle. So we need to somehow clearly define what we will do for you, the customer, spending the whole year on, on working on your, on your problem. So the customer will give you the problem, usually in a vague description that they need some, you know, some application with some features. Your job as a project manager is to organize somehow, maybe again involving some technical people, maybe system analyst or requirements engineer or some, some you know, product managers, and they will break it down, this definition, into pieces. And these pieces, usually people use use cases or sometimes they say not use cases, but user stories. It's more, uh, more like agile term. User stories. So it's like a story of a user. So how the user can use your system. So you describe from a perspective of a user. So you say, I'm as a user, uh, click the button login, and then I enter the email and I enter the password and I click go in and I get into my dashboard and on the dashboard, I click download and the picture gets downloaded to my computer. So you always say, I can go to the dashboard. I can download, I can. So always the word can. And when you use can, then it's again, remember, it's a contract. It will be easy to go to the court and in the court say the user can or the user cannot. And it will be easy to prove can or cannot. All these things are much difficult to prove. For example, should. How can you prove? User should download the picture. Should download the user. So it's, it, that's completely wrong because in this case, you're not positioning yourself as a user, you are trying to describe the life of a user, the intent of a user, the, the wish of a user. It's that, that we don't do this. The user will, it's also quite unclear. The will download. Will it download or it will not download? Difficult to, uh, to control whether our system satisfies this requirement. The user downloads, it's better. Uh, some people say that this is the right way to, to describe the requirements, but I still suggest the can, because other people suggest can. And at the end of the slide deck, you can find uh, a few links to uh, books, which I highly recommend to read about use cases. So basically, if you understand use cases, if you understand how to write these user stories, you will be able to uh, clearly write down any scope in any computer system. As a project manager and as a project manager you will be able to understand whether the requirements document in front of you is actually written well and it really describes the scope so you need to know what is the structure of uh, of use cases how they are uh, how they are organized okay so don't, I'm not going to stay here for too long. Just, just remember that the use case is a short description of a user story, like, like really a story, like a user telling you a story, how he or she was using the system or is using the system right now. That's the best way to specify scope in software systems. Next question. A customer asks you how much work you've left to be done. Where do you find this information? Uh, that's an interesting question. I was thinking... A lot about this so definitely this is wrong and this is right so uh, what is it what is traceability matrix I think that most of you don't know what it means and uh, actually software teams most most very well very experienced software people developers who write code for 20 years uh, they sometimes don't know what is traceability matrix so but let's discuss three so this one is completely out of question you understand it's completely wrong because your team is not Managers, they are not managers. They don't care about this. Asking them this question is is completely uh, un, uh, incorrect because they may only tell you what they're working on right now. They can tell you, yes, my task, which I'm coding right now, will finish in three hours. But the customer is asking how much it will take before you know till the end of the project, which may take another year. 
So this information, you definitely don't go to the team and ask them. This information should be already in your hands. You should have this information as a project manager, not, not asking people, okay, how much, how long. If you need to ask them, it means you failed doing your, your work as a project manager, like we discussed. You need to have this information on your fingers. You need to have it every day. You need to update it every day. You need to look at it every day. So where do you look? The second option, use cases. Use cases is the wrong answer because use cases is just a static description of what totally, in general, we're going to do when the system is finished. So let's say we have, I don't know, in the description, our total description of the functionality of the system, we have 57 uh, use cases, 57 stories. So first story, the user can download the picture. The second story, the user can upload the music. Another story, the user can improve, can fix the, you know, can change the email in the account, and so on and so forth. So there are stories, stories, stories. But they are absolutely not connected to the situation of now. So which of these stories already implemented? Which of these stories are not implemented yet? So we don't know. It's just a, it's just a starting point where the scope was defined. But we are already in the middle of the project. And the question is how much is done. So we need the place where we will see what's done and what needs to be done. So maybe the backlog, we can look at the backlog. You know, the backlog in, 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 in modern projects, mo most people use this term backlog. Backlog is basically the list of uh, tasks, the list of problems, bugs or feature requests, which we expect to do and they are just staying and we're not yet working on them. So we are working right now on like five problems and then we have a backlog of 500 problems. So this backlog is just staying and waiting for our attention. And uh, we also have something which we already completed. So the backlog, we're taking the tasks from the backlog and working on them and then putting them onto some archive and saying, okay, these, these, these uh, tasks are done. So if you look at the backlog, you may potentially say how much is left in terms of scope. But the backlog most probably will not contain all the features which are mentioned in the, in the use cases. So the use cases, usually they cover entire functionality. And then when we start, deliver, start working, then we put on the backlog usually some problems which, we, which are related to bugs, not to the features which are in the use cases. So the backlog, this, this tail of the backlog, or we can say the head of the backlog, most probably will not contain the entire scope information. So looking at the backlog will not tell you uh, what, what's left unless you completely keep the backlog full with everything which was which was defined in the beginning of the project but rarely people do this and it's really unpractical because in this case you will have to you will have to close some tasks from the backlog un unfinished because the situation will change and then put something else something new there so it will be a lot of work you will have to spend with the backlog dealing with the tickets management so people don't do this so what is traceability matrix traceability matrix it's a matrix which looks like this, use case number one, use case number two, use case number three, use case number four. And then you say, uh, let's say uh, in a primitive way, implementation. And then you say, imp and, and let's say, uh, uh, and then you say here, uh, designed, implemented, released, tested, delivered to the customer. And then you say, yes, yes, no yes 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 no yes yes tested yes no no yes yes no 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 so this is your matrix which you keep in front of you during the whole project starting from the first day of the project when the project starts you understand what do you have what are the user use cases how many of them you have and then you build the traceability matrix actually traceability matrix google for this term and uh, you will see that it's a much more much more complex uh, you know, uh, instrument, much more complex artifact. But in a primitive way, it looks like this. And in most cases, the primitive way will be enough. So you list the use cases and then you define the status of each use case and then you just check them when they move forward. In this case, when I come to you and say what is left to be done, you can easily calculate the, the, the places which are minus, 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 and you can tell me, you know, this amount of, I don't know, one, two, three, yeah, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten steps we have left. How long it will take in terms of time? That's a different question. That was not asked. The question is how much work is left to be done? Not how much time, not how much money, but how much work, 
how much work we can tell you. We need to release this use case, we need to test it, and we need to show it to the customer. And then we need to test this, so you know what I'm talking about. So this traceability matrix is the artifact which every serious project manager must have. If you don't have it, it will be very difficult to do scope control. And scope control is all about checking what was expecting, what, was, what we promised to deliver, and where we are standing, how much is delivered now. And this answer, you have to answer to yourself every morning. You have to know every morning what is the percentage, maybe 67% in this case, of scope already delivered. And this percentage must be moving forward. And it has to be a number. It shouldn't be the feeling, it shouldn't be the intuition, it should be the exact number which is coming from somewhere, where it can be coming from matrix, from the traceability matrix. There's only one source of this information. Okay, question number five, which one isn't a non-functional requirement? So non-functional requirement, as we discussed before, it's something that, uh, that you separate from functional requirement. In the functional requirement, you have use cases. So use cases, they are the functional requirements. They just tell exactly how the user can use your system. Non-functional is of what quality will be this usage. That's why sometimes they're called not non-functional requirements, but quality of service. Quality of service requirements or whatever, quality attributes. With the word quality, that's the key element. So what is the, going to be the quality of this experience? Let's say you create me the application, which yes, I can go to my account and then I can upload the image, but the interface looks completely ugly. So I cannot even find where's the button to upload. It's hidden somewhere. It exists, but it's difficult to find. Will it satisfy the, the, the expectations of the customer? It will not. So the customer will be unhappy. So, not, so only implementing use cases is not enough. You should also deliver some certain quality of your system. So you split your document, where you, uh, the, your contract with the customer, into two parts. First, you, you explain use cases. Second, you explain non-functional requirements. Now let's look at this, the difference, how these four elements are different from each other. So let's start from the, uh, from the, from the, from the end. So this one. In case of a security breach at any web server, user passwords won't leak. Is it uh, a non-functional requirement? I believe it is. I believe it is a non-functional requirement. Because in case of a security breach, so there is no use case, there is no user. So we're just saying that when some hacker, some breach will happen, they will attack our web server, then the passwords which stay in, if we satisfy this requirement, then we're gonna our architect will design the system the way that the passwords will be will be staying in some different server, for example, or they will be encrypted. This decision will be made by the architect. We don't care how, but we satisfy this requirement. So is it non-functional? It's pretty clearly defined. Number three, a picture of 100 kilobyte downloads in less than 1.5 seconds. It is non-functional requirement, but it's not really high quality functional requirement. So if this is, in my opinion, quality number one, then this is this quality degrades in this case. A picture of 100 kilobytes downloads in less than 1.5 seconds. In which situation? How many more users, for example, at the same time use this system? What is the hardware which is the software is deployed to? What is the, if it's a mobile app, for example, so what kind of mobile phone I use? If it's the latest model of iPhone, then I click it, it downloads fast. Maybe it's a very old phone, which is very slow and it doesn't download, but it's a different situation. So we can't satisfy all of them. So in order to make this requirement uh, non-ambiguous and completely clear, we need to add more and more information here. For example, on iPhone, I don't know, 12, uh, with the following the traffic, with the following bandwidth of the network and so on and so forth. So we need more information here in order to, in order to make this non-functional requirement acceptable in the court. Always remember, when we're talking about scope, imagine there is a court staying between you, who is responsible for the scope, and the customer, or you and programmer. So the same here, if you give me the task like this, and I'm a programmer, and I'm an architect, so you hire me as an architect, and I come to your project, and you say, I'm going to pay you very good salary, make sure a picture downloads in less than 1.5 seconds. If you don't do it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sue you in the court, and I'm not going to pay your salary. I, as an architect, will say, well, okay, I'm going to do it, but let me please 
sit down and formulate additional requirements. So I need to, you know, my contract will be much more detailed than this very short line. Question answer number two. The, set, the settings page must be intuitively easy to use. This is very, very wrong word here. Intuitively easy. For one person it's intuitively easy, for another person it's not intuitively easy. So this definition of non-functional requirement is, is very, very hard to, uh, to present in the court. So I would suggest that the quality, the quality of NFR degrades, but it's still, it's still a non-functional requirement, but very bad, very wrongly formulated. So somebody who wrote it down was not really an experienced requirements manager. But this one is definitely not a non-functional requirement. Imagine, look at what's happening here. When send is clicked, the email must be sent in less than 500 milliseconds. It's a combination of two requirements, the functional and non-functional. So the person who wrote it down made a mistake. He didn't understand the difference. He just put together. When the send is clicked, email must be sent and in less than 500 seconds. So what if, I, if I'm a programmer? So you give me this task, number one. And I implement you and you click the button and email is sent, but slowly than you expected. Did I implement it? Did I complete my work? Did I finish? You will say no. I will say yes, because I say, yeah, but, but the email is sent. This is the speed that the quality of service and the functionality must always be formulated separately. I maybe not immediately can explain you why right now, but uh, they just should. They just should be done separately. Maybe because the main reason is that it will be easier to manage the scope this way. So you will have the functionality, the, fu the, the scope which relates to functionality, and the, sc the scope that, that relates to non-functional qualities. And they must be separate. So answer number one is definitely uh, the right answer here. So this is not a non-functional requirement. Six. After six months of hard work, your team releases the product to customer service, and the customer says this is not what I wanted. So who is at fault? So, okay. Let's see at the answer number four. The right answer is here. Uh, sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, the right answer is here, the project manager. So let's start from the answer number four. It's nobody's fault. We don't blame. We learn and improve. Again, it's a philosophy of management, which I do not support. I think that we must blame and we must always try to find the fault. And this is how we fix the fault. And this is how we, find, this is how we build motivation in the team. When the team knows that you as a project manager is always interested in finding uh, the, uh, the, the faulty person, in finding the faulty uh, the, the, the errors that are made, that means that you are interested in clear assignment of responsibilities. You are interested in clarity. You are interested in, in clearing, the, <laughs> clearing the error and making sure that everybody understands what's going on. And this is the quality of a strong project manager. The weak project managers, they just say, we don't blame, we don't, we don't, we only learn. It's nobody's fault. It's an indicator of weakness. If the project manager says this in your team, understand the project manager just doesn't have enough um, strengths or doesn't have enough knowledge to do the proper project management. It's difficult to, to assign, like we discussed, it's difficult to uh, clearly define responsibility among people. It's easier to say, we don't blame. So this is not the answer. Number three, number three, testers didn't verify it earlier. Well, this is wrong because the job of a tester is to verify and the job of a project manager is to validate. There are two different things and they always go along. You see at the tag VNV, it's a very, very popular, very well-known term in project management called VNV, verify and validate. So verification is when we look at the product at hand and we, and we look at the requirements and we test it according to requirements. So if you give me the mobile application and the requirement says I should be able, the user should be able to download the picture. So I click it, it downloads, and I'm the verifier, I'm the tester. So I say, I verified the feature, the use case number one. That's called verification. Validation is when I take this product and I bring it to who expected this result and I say, is it really what you expected? Maybe it doesn't work now, don't pay attention to this. But look, the button will be staying here. And when you click it, you're gonna download the picture. Is it what you want? So do we understand your requirements correctly? This is called validation of requirements. So first verification of the product and then validation of requirements. Two processes, they must go parallel. So you as a project manager must organize the testing, which is verification and validation, which is usually your job or maybe the job of a product owner. 
But since we don't have product owner here in the list, then probably it's your job as a project manager. So you should go to the customer and ask the customer regularly whether what, you, what we develop, whether the requirements we have in the, in the document is exactly what you want. Whether the product, which we already have in some earlier versions, is what you want. And then the customer may say, hey, you know, I changed my mind. Let's change the requirements. Because yes, what I wrote you in the beginning, this user story, this use case, I changed my mind. Now it should be something else. You should give the, the opportunity to the customer to say that. And this happens at the validation uh, step, at the validation uh, phase of a, of a project. So who didn't organize the validation? The project manager. Blaming testers will be completely wrong because testers will say, look, I got the requirements, I got the product, I tested, what do you blame me for? It's not my job to talk to the customer. Remember, we don't blame the team, we blame individual, individuals. And the individual team, individual tasker will say, what am, what am I mistake here? It's your mistake, you're the project manager. Don't try to put it on my shoulders. You failed, I did the testing correctly. The same the customer will say. The customer didn't explain what they wanted. Well, actually this answer is better than blaming testers. Blaming testers is completely wrong. The testers are not guilty here. The customer is guilty, definitely. The customer didn't explain what they wanted. So the customer didn't read the document carefully. The customer didn't ask for the validation. So the customer didn't call you earlier and didn't say, hey, make a preliminary re release or show me the, the mock-ups, show me the screenshots of, of your future application. Yes, definitely it's, it's partially the fault of a customer, but you're not going to blame the customer, right? Because, because it's not going to, you're not going to go anywhere by blaming the customer. It's your job as a project manager to predict this risk. And we're going to talk in a few lectures, we're going to talk about risks. And in the discussion of the risks, we will, we will mention this. This is one of the biggest risks in software development. The risk of unhappy customer because the customer was not validating the requirements. So we just forget about this. We just, sometimes we forget, sometimes people are scary to do this. They just don't ask the customer to, uh, to check what, what's there because they, 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 you know, they are trying to complete everything. And only when everything is complete, then they go to the customer. Then they let the customer see the bright product and they fail because it's too late. And the customer will be super unhappy. I've seen many situations like this. When you develop, you believe in what you're doing, you feel like you're doing the right thing, you feel like the product is bright and the customer will be happy. In the end, when you bring it to the customer, it's a huge frustration because the customer says, yeah, you did the really bright something, but it's not what the business needs. Why didn't you show it before? And, uh, and then you say, ah, it's a bad customer. We're going to find, find a better one. They all the same. All customers are bad if you deal like this, if you forget about validation of the, of the scope and verification. Of course, you need V and V. You need testing and validation. But keep in mind, two activities. Verification is whether what we do is right. And the second, validation, whether what we do is what is expected. They have it like uh, what we do is, we, we, uh, we, verification is uh, we, do the, we do it right. Uh, no, what we do is right. Uh, what, that, that's just some, some game of words. What we do is right, or what, what is right is what we do, something like this. So Google for it. Google VNV, you will find many interesting uh, discussions about this, this term. Seven, question number seven, we have two more and that's it. Uh, a project of one year and five programmers can be decomposed into how many work packages? Uh, uh, so, I ask you to decompose. You're the project manager, so you're the pro you have to decompose into elements. How many elements you will find there? So, my, in my opinion, the right answer is this. Nobody knows. Um, uh, why? Because I believe, and this is actually where I totally agree with Agile, is that decomposition must happen on the way. So you should not sit together and plan how you're going to decompose the entire work into small work packages. And there will be many of them there. If the project is one year, then when the project is finished, you're going to have hundreds or maybe thousands of tickets which are in the repository which you completed. But, but upfront, making the decision of how many will be there, 
I would say nobody knows. That will be my answer. If, if the customer, if somebody comes to me and I'm the project manager, I will say, I don't know, I'm not going to give you the number. That's a completely wrong idea. I can only maybe some give some estimate. Maybe I can give some prediction, some speculation about that because I know previous projects. So I can look at the project which we did last year of approximately the same size and I can say, yeah, well, it was 3,000, for example. 3,000 uh, tickets we sold. What about this number, seven? Well, I said seven, I think this is closer to the best answer. Why? Because initially I would start decomposition into a number of work packages. So I would go hierarchically. When you decompose the problem, you go in a hierarchy. So you start with seven, 10, seven, five, some number, some small number. So you decompose, decompose into large pieces. Each of them is smaller, of course, than the, 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 the piece at the, at the top, but they are small enough to be, uh, to be, you know, to, to move to the next level of decomposition. So actually any software project may be decomposed into hierarchy of work packages. And that's, uh, well, any work, not only software development, any work can be done if you decompose it into work packages and they will be hierarchically organized. So the first level of the hierarchy, I would say seven, five, ten, something like this. So that's the answer. About this estimate, I would say it's, uh, it's kind of wrong. Why it's wrong? Because in this case, you expect uh, pretty large work packages, one package per week. So you are attaching uh, the, the scope to the time. And it shouldn't be like this. You shouldn't say that, that the work of a programmer is to spend one week on something. The work package must be completely detached from the time. So you break down the work into work packages, but you never think about time. You just say, we need to implement this class, and then we need to implement this unit test, and then we need to implement to create this server, and then we need to deploy to the server, and then we need to design the UI. We don't think about time right now. We don't say this is going to be two weeks, this is three weeks. Don't think about this at all. Then you break it down deeper and deeper. Well, you don't start in the beginning. You just get, get this work package, give it to the programmer and ask, okay, can you do it? And the programmer will say, I cannot, I need to break it down further. And then the programmer will come back to you and say, the, the, in order to make the UI, I need to make the, because there are many screens, for example. So I need to make screen one, screen two, screens four. So it's going to be 10 different screens. So I need to, I have 10 work packages which are inside my work package. And then you say, okay, so let's start with the first one. And the programmer will tell you, no, we're not gonna start with the first, we're gonna start first, fifth, and, and, and the tenth. Okay, start with these three. And then they say, no, we're not gonna start with the three. We're gonna decompose them into smaller ones. And then we pick these smaller ones and always start from there. So you delegate the work of decomposition of the task to programmers. And the best way is to do it iteratively and to do it while the project moves forward. So you, 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 you try to, you, you ask programmers to decompose until they are ready, they are happy with the element they, uh, they extract from the, from the scope. And they say, well, okay, this is small enough for us, for me, for example, if I'm a programmer. So this is small enough for me to work on this piece. And then you ask, okay, how much time will it take? And then the programmer says, well, that's going to take three hours. But you don't know it up front. It's wrong to say that we decompose in order to fit our work packages into time slots. In my opinion, it's, it's not really a good practice. But this is how Scrum works. You know, this is, this, uh, uh, this is the, the management uh, framework called Scrum, which is based on agile principles. And Scrum suggests to break down the whole work into sprints, which are usually two weeks each. So we start, we sit down, we decide what needs to be done on these two weeks. So we select these work packages. And we assign these work packages to people and say, okay, now you work on this, you work on that, you work on that. And that approximately can tell us how many work packages we can complete in a year. Because we know that in a year we're going to have 25 sprints, two weeks on each sprint. So it's going to be uh, about 25 sprints. And then we have five quarters, so each one work package per week approximately, and then we get the number. But I would not suggest to, uh, to, to think like this because here you mix time management and scope management. No, and the last answer is hundreds. Uh, in this case, it's, it's, just, it's just a random number in my opinion. It's not based on anything, so I would just scratch it out as a wrong answer. Um, let me answer one question here. Uh, there's asking, uh, one of you are asking, should be sprints planned together or it might be done by project manager alone while programmers spend their time on programming? 
Well, I believe that uh, the planning, uh, it's an activity which is, uh, which is done by project manager, definitely. But in order to do it, the project manager must have information. So it's a wrong idea to think that the project manager can do the planning, the scope decomposition, the time estimate by himself without the programmers. And that's a, that's a completely wrong attitude of a project manager. The project manager must first collect the information from all the people around, collect information, and then make a final decision. And the decision must be made based on project charter. So we discussed it last time. So the project manager must have rules. According to these rules, the decisions are made. But the, in order to make decisions, the information are important. Who can provide the information? People. So, so first, and, and, there is a, and there is an answer here, so that it should be together. So again, guys, I'm against the idea of together. We don't work together. Every task, every activity must be done by one person. We never do anything together. When you hear the word together, then you immediately understand that you deal with weak management. You deal with people who are trying to hide their laziness. They are trying to hide their irresponsibility. That's why they say together. That's why they say we do it together. We, we are one team. We are all responsible for the result. That's, um, that's how they uh, manipulate you or that's how they just, uh, uh, they just getting away from, from work. Because when together, it means I don't need to do anything because we're all together. Nobody is responsible. So don't use the word together. It's, a, it's like a red signal for you should be. Every time you hear it, you understand there is some problem with the management. So the project manager should, should work with the team. The project manager asks the person, give me the estimate of your task. And now you give me the estimate of your task. I have two numbers. Now it's my job to how to put these numbers and decide who starts working and who, does, who doesn't start. I, I know your number, I know your, your number. Now I make a decision. You don't work, you don't start this task, you do this. It's my decision. But of course, it's based on, uh, on, on the numbers. So the project manager should be like a dictator in this, in this area, in, the, in these decisions which are made. And this is, should, be, should be declared in the project charter, that these kind of decisions are made. Of course, ideally, the project manager should make this decision using some rules, some laws. So we need to minimize the amount of personal, uh, personal uh, you know, attitude to, to, to this process from the project manager. So ideally, it should be a computer. Ideally, during this course, you will, to the end of the course, you will probably start understanding that all of our, that everything I'm discussing can potentially be done by a computer. So having these project managers, these people on, on, in, the, in the team who, who make this, um, who implement this mechanism, it's, it's redundant right now. So we can easily ask a computer to do that. And we actually tried that. We actually tried it successfully. So we had some experiments with that where the project manager is replaced or, you know, some activities of project management, project manager are implemented by the, by the smart machine. And this machine can do this. So the machine can collect numbers from all programmers. It's not so difficult. So give me the number, the programmer answers. Give me the number, give me the number, collect all the numbers and then calculates what's the best, uh, what's the best pipeline of the tasks. And the machine says, okay, now start working. But you first, you next, you then. And you do something else. This decision can be made automatically. You don't need some, you know, some leadership, some mentorship, some all these ships to be involved. It's a completely routine decision to be made by according to the rules. Okay, so we have 10 more minutes and uh, one last question. What estimate of project scope is the most reasonable for you? Now there are four, four estimates and the estimate is actually something that uh, you will be asked to provide as a project manager. And uh, you have to be able to, um, uh, to use some metrics, to use some, some units of, of measurement in order to decide how to uh, get the scope together. So as you probably already understand now, the right answer is this one. So who are these function points? The function points in a very primitive way, let me explain it this way. So let's say you have use case number, I don't know, 17. And in this use case, you say user can download and user first two user can uh, I don't know log out so this is your this is your use case of two steps download and then log out simple super simple use case 17 so here we have two function points function point one function point two 
So if you look at all your use cases, again, it's a very primitive approach, but it's, it, it helps you understand what's going on. So if you look at all your use cases, which you collected while you were talking with the customer, now you have, let's say, 50 use cases, then these use cases are, can be broken down into functional points. And these func function points. And these function points are the deliverables that we can uh, estimate and we can uh, say that this is more or less a representation of what is in the scope. Because usually we try, if we are quite experienced uh, design uh, requirements engineers, then we try to design our use cases so that they have function points of approximately the same size. So you don't have a, a functional point. For example, you don't create a functional point here, like say, user uh, can, uh, I don't know, let's say, uh, uh, generate, uh, generate, a uh, new uh, picture uh, picture expecting here to be some generative AI to be implemented so in order for user to generate the picture we need to to create the generate generative AI some huge machine there which generates pictures so so the size of this of this function point will be if this is function point three, so the size of function the size of function point three will be let's say approximately three hundred, and the size of this will be two, and the size of this will be one. So one, two, and three hundred. So this this balance misbalance of function points points usually don't happen. So if we are quite experienced uh, people who know how to design requirements, we will try to break this down this requirement this function point to break it down into use case. Uh, 18, use case 19, use case 20. So we will introduce more use cases in order to make sure that all function points are approximately of the same complexity. And if this is true, and this should be true if we are uh, smart enough and experienced enough, then in this case we can promise that our scope will be of 100 function points. And in this case, it will be more or less reasonable number. So if I come to you and you're the project manager and I ask you, okay, how much for this system? And you tell me approximately 100 function points. It's an estimate. So you don't know exactly now because you didn't do, you didn't know even, you didn't start the project. You didn't start the decomposition. I'm just asking you approximately. So if you give me the number like this, then I will say, wow, you have no idea what you're doing. So you're not a project manager because I'm asking you about scope and you deliver me back the time. Or maybe it's not even the time, but in this case you deliver, let's say it's not, it's not calendar hours, it's say, let's say it's the hours of work, so it's the work hours. But in this case, still, you promise me that that will take some hours, but they have no information about the, what you will do. I don't want you to spend hours, I want you to implement functionality, and functionality cannot be measured in hours of work. And I don't care especially about your weekends. So telling me about your weekends, it's a completely misleading and it's only, it only tells me that you're not a project manager, uh, you're not managing, you're only hoping that things will happen because you work on the weekends. But, uh, but the project managers don't do that. Project managers don't work on weekends, first of all. They don't ask people to work on weekends. They actually don't like when people work on weekends. So project managers, good project managers, they completely discourage people on spending some extra time, some their vacations, their weekends, their overtime. It's all the signals of uh, improper project management. So when you say this about weekends in the estimate, it's an immediate indicator for me that you are not a, you're not a professional project manager. So this number four is completely out of picture. You don't estimate in hours of work, again, because it doesn't matter how much your time you spend. What's important, what's the functionality you deliver? So the right answer is this. What about lines of code? Lines of code is not completely wrong uh, method of estimating scope. We can measure with the lines of code, but uh, it's possible to, to measure in the lines of code. And I actually have a video in my channel on the YouTube where I explain that lines of code is not a bad indicator of, of the scope, but only if you have very strong, tight control of what can be there in these lines of code. So if you have a very strong system of uh, code review, a very strong system of quality control, maybe double reviews, or maybe some, some kind of uh, extra checking for the, for the falsification of the lines of code, for code duplication. So if you have a very strong mechanism of, of control of what's going on inside your repository, then you can measure lines of code. Then you can say, we never accept duplicates. We never accept code, which, with the lines of code, which do, which do some wrong things. So we only accept very clear, clean, well-tested code. 
In this case, why not? Why can't we estimate in lines of code? We can see what was done two years ago in a similar project, and they delivered 100 lines of code. You come into us, your scope of work, we look at it with the description, and we believe that it's going to be two times smaller, so we're going to deliver 50,000 lines of code. So now when we start, we can track our progress by the lines of code. It's, it's, it's okay, so don't, uh, don't buy when people tell you that lines of code is a completely wrong mechanism of, of, of tracking. Um, uh, of, of tracking your progress okay and uh, pull requests merged it may be not a bad idea because uh, because you uh, it's even better than lines of code because every pull request is something that is again coming to us and being accepted by the team so when we when we have 500 pull requests then most probably it will tell us how much functionality we implemented how much features how my, how many function points get into the repository but, of course, again, the best method to count the scope is by function points. Read about them, function points, Google it, you will find the description of what it is, uh, how to make them balanced, how to make sure every, each function point uh, is, in, is in more or less in line with other function points. And that's an instrument of estimation. Okay, so we are done with our questions. Now the homework for you. Uh, on, like, like we did before, by the end of each lecture, I give you some homework, which is one document. So this time it's vision document. It's, uh, the, this uh, name was, uh, I believe, is coming from IBM, from, from their rational unified process. But I like this name. Vision document is it's kind of short, uh, maybe one, two pages, uh, which explains the scope, which defines the problem, what we solve, which is the highest level definition of the scope. And then it defines what needs to be done on a very, very high level of abstraction. So we're not even talking about use cases here. We're talking about high-level functional uh, requirements and high-level non-functional requirements. So try to think about some system which you developed before, some pet project, something you did before, some coursework, and make a vision document for it. Explain five, six high-level functional requirements in the format which I give you, like which I gave you. User can, and then blah, blah, blah. And then make five, six non-functional requirements. What will happen with the system? How beautiful it will be? How fast it will be? How, how st uh, stable it will be? And so on and so forth. And that will be, I believe, more or less enough. So the problem definition and then, uh, and then your functional requirement, then non-functional requirement. That will give you the, the understanding of uh, high-level scope definition. Uh, there is a question here, functional requirement equals to use case. No, I don't think that function, a functional requirement, yeah, use case, sorry, I, I thought function point. Functional requirement is use case, yeah. The use case is a, is a method of explaining functional requirements. Non-functional do not belong here. Use case is only for functional requirements. Okay, so that's it. I hope you are, you started to work on your research projects. If you need any help, uh, let me know, uh, but... You see, they, they, all of our topics are related to, to management. So I'm interested for you to go to the real people and validate some of the assumptions which we can make about the quality of project management in modern software projects. Uh, the question is, should we provide visual references in the homework? Well, the vision, vision document which we create in this homework should be as short as possible. So imagine this document should be readable by the customer in... 10 minutes maximum, maybe five even minutes. So it should be fast. So if you want to show the, the picture, if you want to show it visually, something is necessary to show, for example, a mock-up of the user screen, which will tell more than the text, then yes, definitely use the picture. But think about, think about readability of your document for the customer. The better the customer understands your vision, the, 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 the closer they will to your understanding of the scope. And your job as a in this case, as a manager who is responsible for the scope, is to make sure that the customer understands you as well as you understand the customer. Then you will be able to decompose it and deliver your vision, your tasks, to programmers.